Today on Lockdown Red Wings, there's some tough roster decisions that are coming up and previewing the weekend's games. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ news radio podcast. I did Thursday's episode. I did it on the Mega Millions jackpot that is quickly approaching $1 billion. And uh, wow. why you, if you win the lottery, the first thing you should do with that money is nothing at all. So go check wow. that out on the Odyssey app or wherever you guys listen to your podcasts. And then Scotty, host of Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. Happy Friday, Scotty. We made it through another week. Another week in the books, buddy. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. So on the docket for today's episode, obviously, we're going to preview both Friday and Saturday's games against the Florida Panthers at home and then on the road in Toronto. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, we didn't really get to have a full on conversation about the Jacob Verona thing yesterday after he cleared waivers, because obviously the Red Wings put the New Jersey Devils. We talked about it briefly. I kind of just want to reiterate my thoughts on the matter in that, you know, he cleared waivers, got officially sent down to activate Robbie Fabry, and that it seemed like the most logical reason was or is probably the reason. Of course, we still don't know officially, but Lalone said in a post-game, post-practice media availability that it was a conversation between he and Iserman about who needed to be sent down, and they decided on Verona. That's all they said. No, no explanation given the most logical explanation as to why they sent him down is they knew he wouldn't get picked up off waivers and they knew he wasn't NHL ready and they knew he wouldn't get picked off waivers because of that and his huge cap hit. So that seems to be why he got sent down. And now he has time as much time as he needs to get back up to full game speed. And inevitably when he's there, he'll get called back up. I'm sure. I'm 100% confident, and I'm not necessarily afraid of his future with the organization. I, I think that until I hear otherwise, I, I'm betting my money on that this was just a conditioning thing, that they needed a roster spot, he was taking up a roster spot and couldn't use it. That's what I think. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation, obviously, just because of the the season like off the ice that he's already had and whatnot, and um, it's... Seeing him clear waivers was was great, honestly, and and seeing him, uh, you know, have that reassurance because there, you know, twenty four hours there's a little a little dicey, a little scary that we were gonna lose him, but uh, seeing that he's still in the organization and whatnot. But everybody has a theory, and and there's so much speculation going on and whatnot that it's it's, you know, we, we can only really take what we have, and and I think all that we know for sure is that he's still with the organization, he's playing. So I, I don't know, I, that's worth something, at least a little bit. Like if, you know, if, if, I don't know, I, I don't even want to really go down that rabbit hole, but he's playing games for the organization. And like you said, presumably when his conditioning is back to a place where he wants it and a place where the front office wants it and his production has gotten to a place where he's clearly uh, back on the level that we're used to, then we can expect him to, uh, to to find his way back onto the NHL roster. I, I don't think we should really look at it any other way than, than what you just said, than just we're, we're going to keep tabs on him. Hopefully he'll get his conditioning back uh, to, to where everybody, including himself, is happy with it, and uh, they'll move on from there. So the, the follow-up to that is you have to imagine that with two more players set to return very, very shortly in – uh, Tyler Bertuzzi and Philip Zadina, this relieves a lot of pressure on the rest of the roster because before, I mean, we never would have had guessed that it would have been Vrana that got sent down to the minors. That that came to a surprise. It was a bombshell to all of us. But having Vrana be the one that sends down to the minors that needs more time to condition, I mean, that really relieves the pressure on the rest of the roster because now you have two more guys that are going to get uh, sent down or 
put a place on waivers at the very least if they get claimed. And you have to still imagine, and then we we said this with the Verona situation, you have to imagine eventually it'll be one of the three goalies. And I know Nadalkovich is in the AHL right now um, in on a conditioning stint, played great in his first game with the Griffins, got the number one star, made 26 of 27 saves. Great, great for him. But you have to imagine eventually you don't carry three goalies, especially when you have skaters that are ready for a roster spot. I mean, are you just going to continually give goalies conditioning stints when they're not getting enough? It doesn't. It just doesn't make logical sense. So if you factor in that one of those guys that gets waived is going to be a goalie, and you know, I, I would hate to see either of them waived because Halberg's been playing. You know, he's been performing dutifully in his role as the backup in this time being, and his pads are sick. And obviously, Nedeljkovic, we have a soft spot for as he, you know, last year he came in a really tough position and held down the fort fairly well. He was a Calder finalist, so we were really hyped on him. So I would hate to see either of them get waived, but it's the obvious logical choice that eventually one of them would get waived. Of course, we said this before Verona got waived too, and none of them got waived. But so that comes down to one skater ultimately has to get waived. And then you think about that one skater, you have, I think, three solid options because I'm not willing to waive. After the the way Soderblom has been playing, I'm no longer willing to waive any of the three rookies that are waiver exempt or I'm sorry, I keep saying Valeno's a rookie because I'm lumping him with the other two rookies. He's a sophomore, but either of those three guys who are waiver exempt, I'm not willing to do it because they're playing too well. They deserve a roster spot. So it's Gustav Lindstrom. It's Hugh Suter or it's Adam Ernie. Right. Who do you choose? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. And, and I, I do think that it's, it's, it's nice to know that it's not going at least immediately it's not going to be one of the kids that's very nice but yeah i think the immediate thought which we've talked about a lot and and uh, you know we're not trying to just keep hammering the same point home but like th- there's no way that this team is carrying three goalies long term like that's there there i i refuse to believe it like i it, it is rejected in my head there's no way that that's going to continue so we'll see maybe they i i guess when when the next player, assuming it's Bertuzzi, comes back. That will probably be the goalie. And then the Zadina return will bring in the big discussion, right, on on whether it's one of those three players that you just mentioned. I don't think that that would be the same situation as Verano, where they would have the guts to put Zadina on waivers. I don't think that that's the reality, just because the contract's way different and that's just a much different situation. I think he would get claimed pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, if there's one thing about this front office that we know, it's that, that, that expect the unexpected. So I I, I don't see the, uh, the logic in that. I don't think that we can bank on that or that that's going to happen. But uh, th- there's a lot of waiver exempt dudes and those three dudes that you just mentioned. There's a lot of guys that are going to be in that mix for when Zadina is back for sure. Another thing to consider, too, is Robert Haig is currently on the IR, and right. Uh, he's right around the corner as well, a guy who we don't talk about as much because of the fact that he has less of an impact. Although, I don't know if you saw this. I think it was Jay Fresh posted it. I can't remember if it was him or not, though. Somebody posted a chart, and it was like everyone's defenseman's like denial ratings coming into the zone, and Robert Haig had like an insanely good denial rating. And yeah, part of that was sample size. Uh, that has a huge impact on how good it was. But even in that small sample size, it was really good. And that was something that I just was like, I'm sure, I'm sorry. Are you, are you sure? Can you double check those numbers for me? Cause that's not something Robert Haig's not that guy, but I mean, when he gets activated, that's another guy. And at that point it's either him or Lindstrom. I got to imagine getting sent down. And I got to say, I think Lindstrom, I know he's young yet, but he has been really unimpressive this year. And I don't have as big of a, soft spot for that is for that position which is crazy because i love defensemen but i guess maybe not just for him well it's also just other like situ- right it's also just like the situational like how the roster is constructed and how many forwards and defensemen like you have when those players start coming back but mm-hmm. I, I mean looping this back in like full circle back to verona i mean who's to say how long it's going to take him to come back too i mean that this we this him yeah, passing through waivers certainly kicked the can down the road and like the the tough tough decision when 
uh, that that was kind of looming of all three of these guys coming back very very quickly is now not the reality of the situation anymore at the present moment but like the the best case scenario is that he does then just get the conditioning back together and he starts producing again he's back to what he was and he gets called back up and like then you're just stuck in that same not stuck but you you have to make that same decision that you were going to have to make anyway so I'm um, glad I'm not the one doing those decisions. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. Like you, you've, you've prolonged it and you've delayed it, but you, you've delayed the inevitable still. Absolutely. Uh, when we come back, we'll move into our game previews as there are two games this weekend. So stay tuned for locked on Red Wings segment two. But first I got to talk to you guys today about built bars looking for a delicious treat, but don't want it all that fat and calories. Then you got to try built bar. They just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise taste, then man, I got just the thing for you. You got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious that you won't think they're good for you. Perfect for the New Year's resolution, and I mean, I said it on yesterday's episode, I'll continue to preach it. Built Bars are so good it feels like you're cheating, especially if you go out there and get the Built Puffs. I will continue, continually and always say Built Puffs are amazing, but the normal Built Bars are really good too, uh, especially if you go after my favorites. Like uh, You can't go wrong with the classic chocolate chip. You got the cookie dough, cookie dough chunk puff, always is one I say. But, you know, Scotty, uh, he, he stands by the churro, a flavor I haven't had the luxury of trying yet, but... You know, that's a flavor you should try. There's also peanut butter brownie and coconut almond. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, they've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can get yours at the local Walmart or Sam's Club. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and get a 13-bar box uh, with hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank us later. You can even get a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs at walmart so guys you're going to be happy that you did make sure you go to built.com or visit your local walmart or sam's club segment two locked on red wings podcast uh we're going to move now into talking about a game preview of the florida panthers and man scotty have the florida panthers fallen off i know last time the red wings played the florida panthers we talked to armando and we asked the question did they regress and then they immediately pumped five goals on the Detroit Red Wings winning <laughs> one. Uh, but they, we're talking about the Detroit Red Wings, and we, we recognize what this team is. It's a very incomplete, inconsistent team looking to just take a small step forward this season. That was the goal. Um, the Florida Panthers are a team that won the President's Trophy last year, and it was expected, even though a huge roster shakeup and losing Mackenzie Weger and Jonathan Huberto and receiving Matthew Kachuk in return took place. They were still a team that was expected, at least by our standards, and even Armando admitted it. We expected them to be in that top three mix in the division. Well, they're currently sitting seventh in the Atlantic division with a record of 17, 18, and four. And I know that those bottom, what, five, four positions in the Atlantic division, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, aren't separated all that much by points. But just the fact that the Florida Panthers are down that low is just absolutely shocking as they just try to figure out their identity is. Yeah, for sure. And and this is a, a team that, you know, last season obviously had a phenomenal year. And we talked about uh, on the crossover, you know, the, the moves that they made in the offseason and whether they're going to hold up and whatnot. And, you know, I, I'm just <laughs> – I, I, whenever we play the Florida Panthers, it seems to be an ESPN plus game and I'm, is it again? I don't think so. Wait, hold on. I have this up. Let me check. Yeah. Yeah. You double check. I don't think it is, but it don't, might be. Don't tease me. Do not tease me, Scotty. <laughs> well, you, you tell me, uh, is, oh, it is an ESPN plus game. Well, is it like just like saying, it, hey, it's on ESPN Plus or is it on like I'm we're going to get blacked out of it? I'm checking the NHL app. I'm on ESPN, which, of course, is going to tell right, you yeah. to catch on ESPN Okay, you Plus. keep doing that. I'll keep talking. But it is on Bally Sports Detroit X. So we, okay. we're good. Thank goodness. So <laughs> it's it's not going to be an ESPN Plus strictly game and it's not going to be uh, 
one of those which we seem to always lose against the Panthers. And and so it, it's difficult because recently all of the times we've played Florida, they have just put up a million goals against us. Going back to last season, right? Going back to the last like calendar year of playing this team, they always seem to just explode against us. So it's tough, but yeah, like this team's not having a very good year. And you are better than them in several categories. And it's it's a win. It should be a winnable game, but it's just tough to do, I guess, preview for just because when you're thinking of all the times we've played them in the last like 12 months, it's been a lot of ugly games. No, it absolutely has. And, you know, they're a team that still scores a lot of goals and they're still a very good five on five team at you know, they have the fourth best Corsi four percentage at five on five in the league right now at 54.06. So they're still definitely a threat at even strength. Uh, meanwhile, you know, they got huge goal scorers, guys like Matthew Kachuk, who they got in the offseason are still, you know, they're putting up numbers that you would expect. He's got almost 50 points, 47 points in 36 games played. Carter vehagi has got 31 in 38. But, you know, it starts to really fall off after that. So they're a very top heavy offense. And their goaltending is kind of suspect this year. You know, yeah. Sergey Bobrovsky is doing his his typical. Oh man, it, it's his. He does his typical every like whiplash thing where he's really really good yeah. one season and then really bad the next. And he's having a bad year. He's got a save percentage of eight nine four in twenty three games. He's getting the bulk of the workload. Spencer Knight with eighteen games played, a few less than Sergey, he's doing decent nine oh eight save percentage, which. You know, by the standards of this league this year, where a lot of goals are getting scored, that's not a bad save percentage. That's pretty good. But he's not the guy that they're leaning on on most nights. It's still Sergey's net. And so with the fact that their offense is top heavy and their goaltending is not very good and they stink on special teams, they're worse than the Red Wings on both power play and penalty kill, where the Red Wings are like, I, I haven't checked in a second, but they're still like, low teens, high 20s. The Panthers are below them in both of those categories. Um, although the Red Wings penalty kill has been abysmal since Christmas. It was like 60% or something like that since yeah. Christmas. Penalty kill has been awful. We saw it Correct. against the Devils. This is a very winnable game. And in my opinion, this is a game that the Red Wings don't just need to win, but should win. I know on paper, the Panthers are a much better team than the Red Wings, but on paper, the Panthers are just flat out a better team than they should be playing like. Like, this is a team that shouldn't be seventh in the Atlantic Division. And if you're the Red Wings, I said this about the Devils, who were on a bit of a cold streak, but the Panthers have been on a cold streak all season long. You've got to take advantage of that. Like, this is a game that you've got to win because you went on a huge losing streak, and now you've been win one, lose one, win one, lose one. You've got to start, you've got to get a winning streak going to get back in that race. You're like seven or eight points out of the last wild card spot now. And if our argument for a successful season is being in the mix late in the year, then you got to get closer than eight points. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I I agree. And and like I said, you're you're better than this team in quite a few like statistical and, and team Shouldn't categories. Be. Yeah. So like this, this <laughs> is a, a game that you absolutely should win. It's just when looking at past meetings, the the last a lot have not been very good. So it's hard to really go out on a limb and say that uh, this is this is going to be a a victory. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And this team, I, I just, every year I feel like there's that team that just massively underperforms what everyone says they should. And you know, what's funny is I remember last year, Scotty talking about the Florida Panthers, how they were finally the team everyone thought they should be because for years we kept hearing about how the Florida yeah, Panthers, they were the, the young core that was coming. Yeah. That that was coming. They, they here they come talk coming. Oh, sorry. Wrong sport. Um, <laughs> and it just never, it, it just never happened. It never came to fruition. The team always underperformed expectations. Well, last year they exceeded expectations. For sure. Back to this year, right back to where they were, bottom of the standings, despite having premier talent. I mean, our Alexander Barkov. I know he was hurt for quite a bit of time. He's been great. He's got 28 points in 29, 29 games played. Matthew Kachuk, like I said, has been great. But outside of those guys, like it just, it doesn't feel like this Panthers team has what they had last year. And I don't know if that's because you lost Huberto and Uyghur and they were just a huge part of your culture, but this team's back to where they were, where it's just underperforming. 100%. So uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs game happening on Saturday. And, oh, 
please, 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 please beat the Leafs. Stay tuned for segment three. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. All right, Scotty, let's talk about the Maple Leafs. I hate talking about the Maple Leafs. Everyone always talks about the Maple Leafs. I'm, I don't like it. I don't want to do it. But they are the biggest rival for the Detroit Red Wings. And they are a very are good they? hockey team. 23-8-7, and seven, second in the Atlantic Division. And, I mean, just going down their scoring list, it's insane. William Nylander leads the team 45 points in 38 games. Austin Matthews, 44 points in 38 games. Mitch Marner, 43-38. and 38. John Tavares is still Tavares, 34-38. and 38. Bunting, 29-38. and 38. This is a team that is not only top-heavy offensively, but deep offensively. Like, it just it doesn't fall off for them. It's insane and, frankly, infuriating, but it's okay. They, they choke in the playoffs. That's That's the... The saving grace. It um, is. It's great. Their their goaltending has been a bit of a carousel as they've had three goalies each make at double digit starts this season. Elias Samsonov has made 15 starts for them with a 914 save percentage. Matt Murray has had a hell of a rebound year, which I didn't think would happen. Respect, I mean, we were, man. When Respect. that trade I clowned on on oh, all, we both <laughs> I, I really did clown on their entire goalie situation all off season. So yeah, big, big, big ups, big respect to Murray. You start to wonder if maybe the senders were the problem after a while. But also Matt Murray was very injury prone as well. Yeah. And he spent part of this season hurt, if I recall correctly, as well. Sure. But he's got a nine twenty save percentage. And then, you know, Eric Carl Calgren, he's got uh, 898 save percentage, but a 267 goals against per game because they don't allow shots against. So every single one of their goaltenders has been serviceable. This is just a really good Toronto Maple Leafs team, and I don't really need to say that for you guys to know that. Everyone knows that at this point. Uh, they've they're thir- 12th in the league at Corsi four percentage at five on five with a percentage of 51.50. So they're a little bit more middle of the pack when it comes to the even strength play, but man. The power play. Not not cool. Not cool. <laughs> not cool. <laughs> so I mean not cool. No, I mean, yeah, they're they're one of the best offenses in the league. Um, I mean, one of the best defenses. They're a very deep team. They're a very good team. They're a very talented team. Uh, they won't win in the postseason, and that's something that can help us all sleep at night, but this isn't the postseason. So that that's this is a, a, a tall task. Um I think another thing that really helps them is something that we have talked about for the Red Wings that have really struggled at for the entire season, and that's uh, in the face-off circle. That's, uh, I mean, again, like, they're just so deep. Like, they, they, have, they have three, four, five dudes that uh, can, can win face-offs at a pretty high clip, and so – the, the depth of this team is is pretty unbelievable, and I think that that's probably the biggest facet. And, and as we've talked about, like I said, a lot, success in the face-off circle is huge and something that uh, will certainly be in play in this game, but everything. I mean, their, their offense is great. Their special teams is great. You just mentioned their goalie situation. They're five on five. Like I mean, like everything. Everything is every, everything's great. They're the Maple Leafs. They are a fantastic regular season team, and you got to give credit where credit's due. And as much as I hate them, I hate the strong words, as much as I dislike the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, they are a premier team in the NHL, and uh, they're going to bring it to you. And if the Red Wings want to win this game, they got to play their best hockey. They got to play flawless hockey. And they struggle to do that. And because we talk about it, they're an incredibly inconsistent team and they're not quite fully developed yet. So you just got to have that game. Like think about both of your games against Tampa. You got to have those caliber games against the Toronto Maple Leafs. But the Maple Leafs don't like you either. And they rarely, you know, stink against you. They just don't. Like even in games where you score like eight goals, they score nine. It's, It's crazy. Correct. So, I mean, as far as preview goes, man, that's that's all I got. You got to yeah, play your best hockey. It. So, all right, let's do a how do you, little short how do you feel about a Friday because this is the Friday episode. We don't get to do those a whole I lot. I know. Um, of course, I'm saying that, but I don't actively have a how do you feel about it off the top of my head ready. Oh, 
there's a rumor, and I, I don't know, this may have happened already by the time people are listening to this. I don't know as of recording this. There's a rumor that the NFL may expand the playoff because of that situation with the Bengals and the Chiefs to eight teams each for this year just to make it so seating is easier to figure out because that game's not going to happen, which would make that game on Sunday a winner-go-home game for the Lions. That would make the Seahawks, I think, automatically clinch. And then it would mean that Detroit could make the playoffs with a win over Green Bay. How do you feel about the potential of the Lions making the playoffs this weekend? Oh, I mean, even without the expanded postseason thing, I mean, they have the potential to make the playoffs. And yeah, you don't have to bank on another team doing anything. For sure, for sure. But um, I mean, I mean, regardless, this is what do we have? Like nine Sunday night football games, like ever. (laughs) <laughs> like we don't get primetime football and we're like one and eight in them. <laughs> like, I mean, this is uh, hopefully not the, not the same old lines. And I think it, it's the redeeming thing about it is even if they don't expand the postseason, and even if the Seahawks do win and, and the playoffs aren't a possibility, the fact that this team can finish over 500 after starting one and six and eliminate, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers from the postseason is is, is great. It, it's music to my ears. Uh, it's a, it's a nice consolation prize. It's not what we want. Obviously, everyone wants the postseason, but uh, I'll gladly take some uh, some some sadness from Packers fans. <laughs> well, and here's the thing that is craziest to me is that if that were to happen, I actually feel confident that the Lions could pull it off with how well they've been playing in the second half of this season. Like I Going to Lambeau is normally used to be a death sentence, but Green Bay is vulnerable. They've been playing good football lately, but they're not the same old Packers. They're not the Packers that would just dominate, and the Red Wings. The, Red- sure. the Lions have been playing such good football lately that I, I it's weird that in my head I like, yeah, I could see them winning this game. It's still it's still the Packers in Lambeau, though. I know, I know. So I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I'm pretty sure they're. I'm pretty sure Lafleur has never lost in December or in January in Lambeau in First his entire for tenure as Packers head coach. First time for everything. First time for everything. And maybe that's only regular seen... season games too. I don't know, but there was some stat like that out there. In my entire life, I've never seen the Lions win a playoff game. So, I mean, there's the possibility for anything at this point. That there is. That's still on the table. All right. What do you got for me? Um, how do you feel about um how do you feel about the Tigers offseason so far? I feel like they haven't done a single thing and it's incredibly frustrating because I want them to do something because I don't, I'm in denial that they're going to have to completely restart the rebuild. Like just completely start it all over again. And I'm in denial about that. I don't want that to happen because it's been seven years. I don't want it. I'm in denial. I wanted them to make moves. What do you rebuilding implies you were somewhere though? No, I said restart. So like they they thought they had like they're gonna have to go back to scra- ground zero again. There's not too much to scrap if they did that. That's true because everyone you thought had value turns out isn't very good. Well, at least doesn't have value right now. Yeah, I, I just I think this is uh, and obviously I talk about this a lot on on Locked On Tigers, but doubt it. I think that this will end up just being a year where. New guy in charge, new front office. He wants to see what he has in the current roster. And the only way to do that is to play everybody on the current roster. So I I don't think he really cares about or is in the business of uh, like those short kind of stopgap bubble gum on a leaky pipe one year deals. Uh, And he's just going to play everybody we have. And then I think next year. Because they still did make a lot of moves. It was just subtraction. There just hasn't been addition. So, um, yeah, I think this will kind of be a see what we have in a lot of guys here, which I know is not. You think once Miggy's contracts off the books, it opens up for a little bit more. I think that's the biggest lie that anyone has ever told ever. Okay. I was just curious. 
No, seriously. I think the Miguel Cabrera is the reason why the Tigers haven't spent money over the last five years is literally the biggest lie that I can't believe like anyone really believed ever. Like, I mean, to insinuate that the Illich family like couldn't afford more if it just wasn't for Miguel Cabrera's contract is preposterous. Yeah, I mean, look at Steve Cohen, the owner of the Mets. Look how much money he shelled out. They yeah, literally, and he's think, obviously significantly wealthier than than the Illich family, but that doesn't mean that the Illich family is broke. Aren't, aren't the Illichs in like the top? One of, they're like the fourth, fifth, sixth say, yeah. richest owner in in Major League Baseball. Like, yeah, yeah, but they own multiple teams, man. As if that doesn't increase their revenue. One of them's a um, salary cap sport. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's an, a hard limit on how much they can spend in that one. Uh, yeah. Man, what else? What do I got for you? What do I got for you? Um, how do you feel about Skittles? I feel like they would tear my stomach up if I ate them now. I love Skittles. I, I, oh, I love them too. I just don't think I could handle it. I, I get Skittles. When I was a kid, like they've always been my favorite candy. When I was a kid, I used to um, like ask for Skittles and stuff. Now I pretty much only eat them once a year because I just like don't eat candy really. Um, but I always ask for it. Like uh, I like I get a bag for Christmas every year. I just get like a like a little bag of Skittles every year, um, and it lasts me like a week, and then I don't eat Skittles until the next Christmas. Speaking of Christmas, how do you feel about scratch off lottery tickets in, uh, in your Christmas stocking? That's never been a thing for me. Like I, I know that that's like a a thing that a lot of people do, but that's never been a a thing with uh, with my family or friends or anything. But um. Yeah, how do you feel about Mega Millions getting up to a billion dollars? <laughs> Not there yet. If there's a winner, I think tomorrow's the next drawing. If there's a winner tomorrow. Won't get there. But regardless, that's a crap load of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah, and experts say do nothing. That's the hook. That's the hook. Go listen to the episode. Go do it. You you help How me do you keep feel my about job. Wolverines in the state of Michigan. <laughs> they never existed in the first place. Of course, people in the comments will disagree and say they saw them last week. Um, no, we they don't got to go down I this. Did. Shut the hell up. There's one right here, dude. Shut. I I'm gonna punch you. <laughs> there's literally. If I could turn the camera, I would, man. There's literally a Wolverine outside my window. Uh huh. It's crazy. Uh huh. He's flipping you off. Yeah. No, that's just me outside your window. <laughs> I'm already there. I'm teleported. Uh, all right, man. Let's wrap her up, and we'll do a game, two game recaps on Monday. Going to be full show. Heck so yeah. hopefully they're both wins, and it ends up being like a 45 minute show because there's so much good stuff to talk about. That's what we're banking hopefully. on right now. Hopefully. Uh, any final thoughts? We ball. We ball. We'll be back on Monday, guys. Same time, same place. It's your team. Every day. Every day.